Chad and Jay Mansbridge here, lead pastors of Bayside Church International, based here on the south coast of South Australia. Our great passion as a church is to help people to know Jesus and to demonstrate His love, truth and life in everything that we do. We hope you enjoy today's message. G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special video teaching or audio teaching if you're listening to this on our podcast. This is a a special teaching I'm putting together just really for Bayside Church for this season uh, that we are in as we're in the uh, midst of April school holidays or heading into April school holidays and Easter and looking forward to May. All right, so I'm here to do a very special teaching on the subject of prayer and fasting. All right. Here we go. Uh, Last month in March and into April, uh, I was doing a series uh, on the seven signs of a healthy church. And I was effectively trying to do three things. Number one, just preach about what healthy church looks like. Number two, talk about us specifically here at Bayside and look at the seven distinct DNA uh, pillars that God has given us as a local church. But I did that as a teacher by looking at the church in Antioch uh, in the book of Acts. And we came across the story in chapter 13 of Acts, where it says there that the leaders in the church of Antioch, or possibly the whole church, we're not exactly sure how it reads there, but at least the leaders uh, in the church of of Antioch were praying, worshipping the Lord, and fasting. And in that uh, time period of prayer and fasting and worship, it says, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas to the work to which I've called them. And after laying hands on them, they sent them off. And basically that sending off, that commissioning of Paul and Barnabas, that apostolic commissioning, because from then on, Paul and Barnabas become known as apostles, basically, okay, based there from the church in Antioch. They go into the the Greek speaking world and effectively the rest of the book of Acts and largely church history, okay, is really shaped around that event. And it all began with the church in Antioch hearing the Holy Spirit in the time of prayer, worship, and fasting. And I noted that Sunday morning as I was sort of sitting at home, going through my notes, preparing for that message. It occurred to me, you know, it's been over 10 years since I called, as it were, a corporate church fast. I mean, fasting is something we see in the Bible. I'm going to talk to you about that today. Uh, And it's something that communities do together, not just individuals, but whole communities where they pray and fast together. And it's something that uh, here at Bayside, we've not done since 2000. And eight, and God kind of challenged me that morning. You know that uh, you know have I has He just not spoken about prayer and fasting for ten years, or possibly have I missed it uh, in 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 that time? And uh, or is this something you know that is just a normal Christian discipline that we don't quote need Holy Spirit to talk to us about? We should just do it as a part of everyday life. Well, that's a whole another discussion. But the point is. Uh, having Holy Spirit, I guess, stir that thought in me, okay, about prayer and fasting and about giving ourselves as a church to a period of prayer and fasting. Last week, I uh, saw an email or something on Facebook or something uh, from a a letter from Margaret Court, who's a well-known pastor in Perth. And uh, basically, she was calling on the Church of churches of Australia to give themselves to a period of fasting and prayer in the lead up to the federal elections happening on May 18. And so I kind of took that as a confirmation. Here I am thinking about it. Holy Spirit seems to be stirring and speaking to me about that. Margaret Court comes out with this letter and I thought, you know what, maybe, yep, now's our time. Certainly for me personally, I'm going to be engaging in a 21-day fast for prayer, uh, beginning after the April school holidays and taking us literally through to Election Day. And I'm here on this video or this audio teaching to encourage you to join with me as a church family. All right, so take this video as an invitation to join with Chad on a 21-day period of prayer and fasting beginning, as I said, at the end of April school holidays, basically the start of term two, the Sunday in April would be the 28th. So from the 28th of April through to election day on May 18. And as I just sort of explained with that whole story, this is not specifically motivated or purely motivated by the election, as important as it is. And I really do feel like this is is, is an important election for our country. 
But I just took that as a confirmation of something that God was already stirring in me. So what I want to do here on this video is to just explain some fasting basics, okay? The who, what, when, why, and how of fasting. I want to look at some scriptures, obviously. That's how I always sort of tend to start. And uh, then want to uh, finish with five practical areas that we can be praying into uh, in that prayer and fasting period if you choose to join me. And uh, I sure hope you do. I want to put this invitation out. So please listen to God through my words, all right? If the Holy Spirit stirring you to join with me on this, then by all means, I'd love to have you join me. All right, I want to open up with uh, Matthew chapter 6, look at something that Jesus spoke on uh, in his Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so these are pretty well-known passages here. Matthew chapter 6, he says in verse 2, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand was doing, so it may be done in secret and your Father will reward you. My point in reading that passage is simply this. Jesus says to his crowd, when you give to the needy. He doesn't say if you give to the needy. He says when you give. Over the page, verse 5 says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Same principle there. Okay, there's a, a number of echoed principles, obviously. But here, when he talks about prayer, he doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. And in exactly the same vein, verse 16 and when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they love to disfigure their faces to show that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So it won't be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Each of these three things follows exactly the same pattern about not doing things for the sake of others to see you but do what is done in secret your father sees what is done and he'll reward you all right those three things are giving to the poor prayer and fasting but the other thing that each of the, the pattern of each of these things as jesus teaches them has in common is they all start by saying when you give when you pray and when you fast again jesus doesn't say if you give or if you pray or if you fast, but when? And so there is clearly a, an implicit, uh, Jesus is implying, all right, that the people he's talking to, his followers will pray. They will give to the needy and they will fast. And you know what? For most of us uh, in our Christian disciplines in life, we kind of have a habit. We have a discipline of praying, okay, whatever that looks like for you. You've developed that. You kind of know that's a privilege and a responsibility to pray. We get that. When it comes to giving, we also know that's a privilege and it's a responsibility. Most of us have developed a habit of giving. But what about fasting? You know, certainly for me, of those three things, when you give, yeah, I give, I, I get that done. That's a discipline in my life. When you pray, yep, I get I get that, I do that, Chad's good at that. I, that's a discipline in my life. When you fast, okay, for me, that's the weak one. Okay, that, that that's one. My 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 thing on fasting is not so much when Chad fasts, but if he does. And as I said right at the outset. As a church, it's been 10 years, over 10 years since I encouraged us as a church to fast. Yet it seems the way that Jesus is talking here, that it is the most natural and normal, as natural and normal as giving to the poor is, as natural and normal as praying is, so is fasting uh, here in the Sermon on the Mount. And as we read through the Old and New Testament, that basically is seen, you know, Old and, Old and New Testament seems to show that fasting is a normal part of the spiritual discipline of God's people and not just in the Old Testament okay but in the New Testament that's why I started talking to you about the church in Antioch okay this is a new covenant community and what are they doing there in Acts 13 they're found worshiping the Lord and fasting and in that atmosphere bam God releases Paul and Barnabas into their future 
So all through the scripture, we see this discipline or this practice or whatever of fasting. We see individuals doing it. And I'll mention a few in a moment. We see groups of people fasting together as they pray together, as we do there in the church of Antioch. We see people do it in response to a call from leadership. Okay, Ezra does this, gets up and does a, oh no, not Ezra, Esther. Okay, she puts a call out to people and says, listen, let's fast together. Some people do it for personal reasons, like David. Okay, he had a fast, he purely did it for his own personal reasons. Some people do it for a day, three days, seven days, 21, 40 days. All right, we're going to look at those later. Sometimes it's done in response to something that has happened in the past, and sometimes People fast in expectation of something for the future. Okay, so when it comes to prayer and fasting together, there is a whole, you know, gamut of examples that we have in the scripture, Old and New Testament, all different types of forms and expressions of fasting. But the point is this, it should be, or at least scripturally speaking, it appears to be a very normal practice for God's people. And I'm here to look at that. You know, that challenges me, you know, because I look at that and I go, you know what, for Chad, it's not a normal practice for him. Certainly runs on the board. Look at Chad's calendar. He's not a big faster. And so again, this is something God's been stirring in me. And uh, here I am as a as your pastor, I guess, wanting to share with you how about you follow me in on this journey as we look to fast together for 21 days. All right, here are three simple components to fasting. I mean, I could speak on this for ages. As I said, I'm not on the preaching roster uh, or, or there's no real great time on the next couple of Sundays to talk about this on a Sunday. Hence the video. You can watch this in your own time and some of you are going away for April school holidays anyway. But here's three major uh, components to prayer and fasting. Okay, Fasting is abstaining from satisfying certain physical appetites. Okay, So it has to do with abstinence. Abstaining from satisfying certain physical uh, appetites for a set period of time for the sake of prayer and worship. Okay, so it's abstinence for a set period of time for the sake of extra, basically, prayer and worship. Those three things. When it comes from abstaining from physical appetites, uh, one of the most common forms of fasting, really, that we see in the scripture is fasting from food. Okay, David did this in 2 Samuel 12 when his son fell ill and he prayed for the health of his son. Jesus did this in Luke chapter 4 after the desert. He went into the desert and fasted from food. It doesn't say fasted from water there, but fasted from food there for 40 days. Daniel does it in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, interestingly, the way Daniel does his fast is it's only a partial food fast. Okay, he doesn't fast from all food. Uh, he just parts, uh, it says there from choice food, which some people may, uh, think means bread, okay, from wine and also from meat. Okay, so basically from bread, beef and beer, if you want to, you know, alliterate it, which I always do. Okay, so from bread, beef and beer, he just, he fasted from a partial food. But, and then he, what did he do? Well, he filled his tummy with fruit and vegetables. Okay, that's called the Daniel fast. So that's what Daniel did. Some fasts in the Bible are full on food and water. All right, that's hardcore. I mean, uh, Israel did that at the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 23. They had a full 24 hours with no food or drink. Jews today who celebrate Yom Kippur had that 24-hour period with no food or drink. Uh, when Esther, in Esther chapter 4, she puts a call out to the Jews in Babylon, okay? And she says, listen, these, um, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name. Was going to kill everyone or kill all the Jews. And she said, listen, why don't you all have a three-day fast, I think it was, from food and water? And so that was a full-on fast. And then you've got a Moses, Elijah, Ezra, and Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 9, who all fasted from both food and water. So that's hard hardcore. So you can do food only, partial food, you know, certain types of food, or full-on food and water. And then Paul introduces us to this other form of abstinence, okay, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, where he talks about married couples abstaining from sex, okay. And he says, listen, for sex, again, for the purpose of prayer and fasting. So that's, you know, fasting doesn't just, it can go beyond food. Go beyond food and water, go beyond food, certain types of food. It can go outside the scope of food and it can relate to other physical appetites. Okay, that's why I described it like way, that way. Abstaining from certain physical 
appetites and sex, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, is one of them. And I think under that category, you can even add other physical appetites that we have. Okay, You can abstain from technology. I mean, there's a physical appetite. How many of us have this appetite to reach into our pockets and grab our phone or flick on the TV? It's We, we use technology to satisfy physical urges that we have. Well, fasting, I believe, uh, can definitely uh, include that. So that's the first thing about fasting. What is fasting? It's abstaining from certain physical appetites. Number two, it involves doing so for a certain period of time okay in the bible we have one day fast the the day of atonement leviticus 23 is an example of that it literally was a 24 hour fast paul esther and ezra theirs were three day fast david fasted for his son for seven days the daniel fast was 21 days three weeks that's what i'm looking to do moses Elijah, and jesus were all 40 day fast so there's one three seven 21 and 40 these great numbers different set periods of time for fasting uh the sex one in 1 Corinthians 17, uh, when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he just says there, he doesn't actually give a time period. I think he's just like, hey, that, that's none of my business, you know. But what he says there is when husband and wife agree for a period of time. Okay, so it's up to you. You just set whatever time you want. So there you go. So for when it comes to fasting for a set period, basically you can do whatever you choose to do. But the point is this, it is a period. It is a set time, a beginning and an end, whether it's one day, whether it's 40, whether it's a set period of time. This is what we agree. That's going to work for us. That's what we, we, we feel that we can do. Then it is a set um, period of time. And the third aspect of fasting, it's abstaining from certain physical desires. It's for a set period of time. And thirdly, it is for the sake of prayer. All right. Fasting, food, let's say, without praying, without doing it for the sake of prayer, is just dieting. All right. Fasting without praying is just hunger striking. All right. That is not what we are talking about. The purpose of the abstinence, the purpose of abstaining from something is so that we may give ourselves more so to something else, is to give ourselves to prayer. The church there in Antioch in Acts 13, they weren't just fasting when the Holy Spirit spoke to them. It says they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Okay, They were abstaining from something so that they could fill that void, that gap with something else, which in our case is worship and prayer and if effectively drawing near to God, seeking the Lord, etc., etc. And one of the, there's two basic ways that fasting does that. The, basically, the first thing it does is it clears up time in your day. I mean, if you fast from food, okay, whether it's one meal or three meals or whatever, okay, the, it, the, you are saving certain time in the day for preparing food or for eating food, etc., etc. Okay, so basically what it does is it clears up time and in that time you'd normally give to food, eating, or preparation, you now give to prayer, the word, worship, etc., etc. So that's one of the things that it does. When you fast from technology, you fast from TV, you fast from Netflix, or whatever, whatever you choose to do, one of the things you're doing is you are filling that time gap with prayer and worship. So that's one of the obvious benefits. If you uh, agree to fast from sex, then, you know, there's there's an extra five minutes you've spared once a month. I mean, fantastic, you know, give that to prayer and uh, and you'll be absolutely fine. The other thing that fasting does, um, uh, the, the one of the reasons that it helps us to pray is because it reminds us to pray. This is one of the things in my experience with fasting that hunger pains gives you. When you get that hunger pain, if you're fasting from food, for example, when you feel that, you go, oh, why am I feeling that? Oh, that's right because I'm going to pray. It's like an automatic, it's your body reminding you, oh, man does not live on bread alone. I live for the presence of God. Okay, so that that hunger pain, that physical response of your body reminds you to pray and to press into God. And that happens regularly. So you're finding yourself um, praying more. The same thing with technology. You know, I'm the kind of person, honestly, I know I have an addiction to my phone. I know there's time. I reach into my pocket. I've just put my, I've just checked my phone, you know, and 30 seconds later, within a minute later, I'm reaching back into my phone to get it out. It's like a habit. And so here's the thing with fasting. When you fast from a habit, maybe you don't have your phone, maybe your fast is for three hours of the day or whatever, or for one whole day, I just don't have my phone on me. I don't know, whatever it is. You, you, you fill that void with prayer. You're not just abstaining from something. You're abstaining, number one, for a period of time. Number two, three, for the sake of 
prayer and worship and so that abstinence if you have a habit of doing something that habit replacing that it reminds you uh to pray okay because basically what we're doing in a in a period of prayer and fasting is we're replacing one habit with another okay you're replacing one habit with another and that new habit is prayer you're giving up one thing so that you can replace it with something better okay and in this case that something better is making yourself aware of god all right fasting is not trying to pull god's arm it's not hunger striking like i said before it's not trying to prove to god how darn serious you are it's got nothing to do with that whatsoever you had access to god as i said right at the start prayer is a privilege and a responsibility but it's a privilege we can draw near to god because of who jesus is what he's done for us we have access to the throne room of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need because of jesus that's why we can approach god and we can do that anytime but what fasting does is it clears up time for us to do that more and it reminds us during the day bam that's why i'm feeling hungry that's why i don't have my phone on me because i'm concentrating and i'm making myself more aware of the presence of god you, you don't have more access to god's presence fasting just enhances your prayer life by giving you more awareness of God's presence. And so that's why a lot of people talk about fasting like turbocharging your prayer life. It's just a great boost because you're filling a void with something else. You're abstaining and leaving a void. You're not leaving a void. You are then filling that void with your awareness of the presence of God. All right. So there's basically three things there about prayer and fasting. It's abstaining from certain physical desires and appetites for a certain period of time for the sake of of prayer and fasting. I guess the question you need to ask yourself is, what appetites do I want to fast from? Will it be food? Please do not do food and water for 21 days. I do not encourage that. Uh, you know, the food and water ones really only one days, uh, one day is, or in, in some cases, three days. Uh, anyway, the point is, um, is it food? Is it partial food? Is it technology? Or is it something else, a physical desire I have that, Lord, I'm going to relinquish that desire for a certain period of time to give myself more to prayer and awareness of your presence all right that's the challenge i want to put out to you uh for me in my 21 day i'm, I'm going to set a 21 day period as i said from the end of april the 28th of april through to election day on may 18 not only because of the election i'm going to talk in a moment about five different areas we can pray into i'm not entirely motivated by the election as important as that is but i think that's a great neat period it's at the end of school holidays it's after easter okay and anzac day weekend it's after the school holidays and it's a it's a fresh way to start term two and so for me it just fits really neatly as well so i think that's a great time and to know that other churches around australia are going to be fasting in that 21 day period i just think it's confirmation on confirmation so i'm really happy to do it that way for me it's going to involve certain types of food i'm not going to do a full 21 day food fast entirely i'm going to do certain types of food and i'm also going to have certain restrictions on technology so that's the approach uh, I'm going to be taking. I haven't exactly worked it out yet, but I, I know that's what I'm going to be doing. All right, I'm going to finish now with five areas to pray into. Okay, this is a really simple thing that you can remember. I'm just going to use my fingers. If you're watching, uh, don't use my fingers and just uh, encourage you to pray into five areas as you give yourself more to prayer and fasting. Number one, your thumb. Okay, what does your thumb speak of? Well, your thumb is your biggest finger it's your first in fact a lot of people say it's not even a finger it it's its own entity okay it's kind of a finger but it's its own thing it's a thumb it's a standout without it the rest of the fingers are, are, are basically useless all right when you look at your thumb number one prayer is number one prayer to god it's god is number one it's praising him it's thanking him it's worshiping him it's not asking something of him it's not directed to any it's purely directed to him okay when you see your thumb number one just worship remember god first serve him with your words serve him with your song pray in tongues to him okay and have your focus and adoration on him number two your second finger well what's that that's your pointing finger okay basically anything you can point at 
Pray for that, okay? This, when you look at your second finger, that's the world around you. As you're driving your car and you wave to someone with your second finger, boom, pray for them, okay? Pray for the houses you can point at, businesses you can you can, you can can point at, cars that are driving around that you can, you can point at. Pray for the world around you. That's what your second finger represents. Anything you can point to, pray for them. The Bible says pray for all people at all times, all right? So that's Australia, that's the world, that's your community. Anything your finger can point at, point at, uh, pray for them and uh, pray for those. Thirdly, your middle finger. Well, what's your middle finger? It's your tallest, okay? It's the biggest of the lot. It's the one that stands above. When you see your third finger, pray for those in authority, okay? This is like 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, I urge them that uh, prayers and requests be made for those in authority. And particularly in these three weeks leading up to um, uh, May 18, pray for the election. I pray, pray for those in government, you know? Another way to remember the third finger is often those in leadership, you know, are given the the, the finger by people. They're, they're not treated particularly well in our culture and people put the finger up to them. No, 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 no. Use that tall finger to remember these are the people that God has placed in authority and particularly for this election, you know, our seat here in Mayo uh, could go either way, you know. So this is, it is basically a swing seat now. So it is important for us to pray and to vote well in our area. Pray for those um, who stand up tall and take those positions of leadership. Fourthly, your fourth finger. I don't have my wedding ring on today. Don't tell Jay. Uh, it was because I went to the gym yesterday, you see. Um, the fourth finger is your covenant finger. That's the one your wedding ring goes on, all right? When you pray for your fourth finger, pray for those that you're in covenant with. Basically, pray for family, those who are you are closest to. Pray for your blood family, your married family. Pray for your friends and pray for your church family, okay? Pray for those closest to you, those that you have a covenant relationship with. And lastly, your little finger, well, your little finger's the weakest, isn't it? It's the most vulnerable finger that you have. It's the one that is the most easiest, uh, easily breakable finger, okay? So this finger, when you see that one, pray for those who are most in need. Pray for those who are struggling. Pray for those who are ill. Pray for those who are suffering. Pray for those who are lonely. Pray for those who are the elderly. Uh, pray for children, okay? The most vulnerable in our society. Just remember that little finger speaks of the most vulnerable, okay? Five simple things without pres- over-prescribing to you. Number one, your thumb, worship God. Absolutely. Why? What am I replacing my abstinence with? I'm replacing it with worship. Why am I getting this hunger pain? I'm rep- oh, that's reminding me to draw near to God and to worship Him. Number two, I just pray for anything and anyone that I can point to. Number three, my, my big finger stands high above the others. I pray for those in leadership. Number four is my covenant finger. My wedding ring is on that finger. They're the ones I pray. My friends and my family, my church family, I pray for those people that God has connected me with in covenant. And lastly, my most frail, and fifth finger. I pray for the most vulnerable people. I lift up the weak to a loving, loving father. Well, I hope that helps guys. Five simple areas you can pray to anywhere. Just look at your hand and pray for them. And please, if you sense the grace to do that in whatever capacity you can, I would encourage you to join with me from uh, April, the last uh, weekend in April, straight after school holidays, the Sunday, the 28th of April, through to May 18 election, National Election Day there on the Saturday. It's a clean 20 one weeks. During that period of time, we also have a ministry visit here at Bayside with Rob and Glenda Rufus. All right. So a great thing with your fourth finger to be praying for, praying for that weekend and for God's input into our church family that weekend. Okay. So there's other things that we'll also see happening in those three weeks. And we'll let you know about those uh, at Bayside sometime on a Sunday. Bless you heaps. Thank you for your time today and uh, love you lots. Have an awesome April school holidays and Easter. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time I'm looking at you. Bye. I hope you've enjoyed today's message. Remember to check us out at baysidechurch.org.au. And of course, if you're ever in the area, please pop in and say good day.